All right, thanks, Angela. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, make this presentation um, as part of the MIDAS uh, seminar series. The, the topic that I chose to share with you today is improving understanding and prediction of camber of pretension concrete beams. Um, I think with the MIDAS software, if you have used or you're a user of MIDAS, um, most of the presentation tend to focus on um, the analytical simulation of, of structural members or structural systems. What I have chose to do is um, show you what the reality is, and then I'll talk a little bit more about um, how you can simulate or obtain more realistic estimations uh, using MIDAS uh, tools. So this is based on a project funded by the Iowa Hyper Research Board. Um, Iowa Hyper Research Board wanted us to look at the Camber challenges and come up with a solution. So we teamed up with Iowa DOT and three other precast um, companies near um, Iowa DOT. They all produced beams for Iowa DOT in the past. Uh, that includes Coast Lab structures in Omaha, Cretex in Falls, uh, Iowa Falls, and Andrews Priestess Concrete in Clear Lake, Iowa. Besides myself, the project team included uh, Dr. Rouse. He is a lecturer with Iowa State University. Uh, then three graduate students, Everdo Onawar is a PhD student, James Nervik and Benjun He both have graduated and working um, in the field now. The project has a website. You can obtain additional materials or links to reports uh, if you are interested, and we'll keep that project website updated with more findings. So here's an outline of what I want to share with you today. I'll give you a quick background about the problem um, and then discuss the primary task of the project. And we'll spend some time on instantaneous camber. Um, often instantaneous camber is not given adequate um, emphasis. Um, you know, there's, there's a belief that you can ignore the instantaneous camber error or simulation and go straight to long-term camber. So I'm going to spend some time on instantaneous camber, then talk about long-term camber, MIDAS analysis that we have completed, and I'll wrap up with some key findings. So for those who are not familiar with camber of um, precast pretension concrete beams, um, so basically this is a uh, net upward deflection that results from the applied precess force after you subtract the downward cell phase deflection. So the, the question is how accurately one can quantify this uh, net upward deflection from the time the pre stress is transferred to the beam all the way to uh, using the beam in the, uh, in the, in the field uh, during construction. So that's what the, the question is and how accurately one can quantify the camera. Um, as I noted, the the pre is, the, the camber is going to exist from the time you transfer pre stress until the dead and live load deflection exceeds that due to pre stress. And at that point, you're going to have a downward deflection and you will be dealing with then down, downward deflection after the dead load and live load deflection exceeds that induced by pre stress. Now, the pre stress concrete beams go through different stages, and in different stages, the camber will be affected by various parameters, and we will be looking at several of them that some of some of them you may know, some of them you may not know, or you, you didn't realize. So I'll go through that in, in detail. Um, and then I'll just briefly talk about the, the challenges, what happens when you don't have the expected camber or when you end up getting much larger camber than what you anticipated in design. So if you look at the um, pretension concrete beams, starting with, um, let me use a pointer, hopefully you can see. So starting with casting of the beam, within a day or within one to three days you will release, and you will end up with the, uh, that's when the transfer takes place, you will end up with the, the camera at that point. Then the beams get moved to the storage yard where it may sit for one to three or sometimes even longer. And after that time frame, you will be um, transferring the beams to the job site where the beam will be lifted and put in place, the um, deck reinforcement is placed, and the cap or the diaphragm region as well as the deck concrete will be placed. 
So the camber of the, the pre stress concrete beam from the stage two here will be changing as a function of time. And along with that, you also want to realize there are changes to the boundary condition that takes place. And all of that needs to be accounted for if you want to accurately quantify the camber at a given time. So that's what I emphasize here. The changes in support condition as well as the environmental variation should be included together with time-dependent behavior of concrete and pre-stressing speed. So here's an example of a challenge that you may face in the field that you, um, you know, if you underestimate the actual camber in the field, what's going to happen is that the gap between the, the deck profile and the bottom of the, the top of the beam will be large. And if that gap is more than a certain uh, dimension, then you are required to put additional non pre um, reinforcement as shown here. So this reinforcement needs to be placed so that the concrete sitting here can be connected with the, the deck concrete. So this is where the, the hunch thickness is going to be dictating as to whether you need an additional reinforcement or not. And this one shows the additional reinforcement that you will be placing. Now when this situation arises in the field, there's always dispute because you don't know who should be paying, uh, who should take responsibility for this error or the discrepancy. Um, you can argue that the design camber was um, underestimated. You can argue that the pre stress fabrication ended up producing larger camber than anticipated. Or the contractor can be blamed for not setting the profile right and therefore the, um, the, the gap between the, the deck profile as well as the top of the beam was more than what was anticipated. So this is a, a typical problem in the field. And uh, it not only you know, ends up causing more money or more construction costs, but it often creates um, delays in the construction because of the dispute that comes up. So as part of the project, when we got started, um, I realized that it, it's important for us to uh, understand all of the variables that come into picture. And therefore, uh, instead of starting this project with uh, monitoring the sh short term or the instantaneous or long term camber, we actually started looking at, at, at the very basic things. So we started with the material characterization and then get into the instantaneous and long-term camber measurements as well as we looked at how one would accurately estimate this um, camber. So for this accurate estimation, we've looked at simplified methods like Iowa DOT, for example, uses. And then we also use MIDAS to simulate the camber values in the short term as well as uh, for the long term. So um, what we did was we talked to the precast fabricators in the region here, and we identified four high-performance concrete mixers and three normal concrete mixers that we thought we should evaluate. The local precasters no longer use the normal concrete mixers, but nevertheless, we evaluated them just to look at how, uh, in the past, the issue was uh, for the DOT and, and how big of a difference these material contribute material characteristic contributed to the difference. For these seven mixes, we evaluated the compressive strength, modulus, creep, as well as string gauge values. The creep and string gauge value, as you can see here, was uh, monitored on sealed specimen as well as unsealed specimen to, to look at the difference between the two and compare them to the real um, structure so that we can get a feel for what would be most appropriate for, uh, for our use. The modulus evaluation uh, indicated to us that ASH to LRFT 2010 equation is fairly reasonable. It does have an error of anywhere from uh, uh, you know, 0 to 15 percent. But the, the main concern we had here was that the modulus can be uh, estimated accurately as long as you calculate the actual, uh, you, you use the actual strength of the concrete. So which I will talk about it later in terms of uh, the difference between the specified strength versus the actual measured strength. So these are the two equations we ended up with. So these are average creep coefficient uh, uh, as a function of time as well as the average string gauge strain. These are average for high performance concrete. We also found out that the, the seal specimen actually provided more realistic numbers than the unsealed specimen. The unsealed specimen tend to provide higher values. 
And as you can see here on the bottom, we basically cast large chunk of um, beams without reinforcing steel, and we measured the shrinkage and uh, on, on those samples and compared to our sealed and unsealed specimen to realize which one corresponds with the, the large deep beams um, uh, compared to the, the sealed as well as the unsealed small size specimen that we used in the environmental chamber. Okay, so I'm going to now start to looking at um, the instantaneous camber. The, the measurement for the instantaneous camber is typically taken uh, with respect to the, uh, the bottom of the, the you know, with, with respect to the, the precast bed. The, the measurement could be taken as shown here to the bottom of the flange or it could be measured to the top of the flange. Uh, we observe that most often the bottom is used in, uh, as a measure because you have a uh, much smoother surface and therefore you can measure the, 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 the camber more accurately. When you use a tape measure, often the, rec uh, the actual camber was recorded um, to the nearest one sixteenth of an inch. So if you look at what people have recorded, so this figure shows what we were able to gather historical, uh, uh, historically. So we went back and looked at with the three precast plants for each of the beams they, they produced, what was the, the design camber or the predicted camber versus actually measured by the precast concrete fabricator. And if you look at the difference versus the, uh, the beam length, you can see that it's all over the place. So even it, it doesn't give you any indication that whether be, when the beam is shorter or longer, you are getting a better response or not. Whether you are over predicting or under predicting, it seems to go in, in both directions. Uh, so this was a concern starting the study uh, because we know that there is the, the, the discrepancy between expected and expected and measured are large. And then even if you take one particular type of beam, the measured values is uh, sometimes over predicted, sometimes under predicted. So it was a concern that we felt that that something is not right in terms of how the, the exercise is done. So we decided, so the, the data that you just seen is for nearly 1,000 beams. I think it's over 1,200 beams uh, that we collected data from their, uh, from their record. But then we decided that we're going to collect data on our own independent of what the precasters were uh, collecting. So for this purpose, we actually deployed a, a rotary level uh, we measured up to, again, 1 16th inch accuracy uh, at 100 feet distance. Um, in addition to that, we also used uh, string potentiometers on a on number of beams to look at the actual displacement more accurately. So here we, we were able to get um, displacements as accurate as uh, up to 0 0.015 inches. So that was obviously giving us a better, better uh, reading, and uh, so we thought we should collect this information in addition to the rotary level. So the rotary level was used on about 110 different beams. The string potentiometer as shown here was measuring typically the, the top flange at number of locations, and then we would also measure the deflection of the bed to make sure the bed is not moving as you release the precess and transfer the, um, the actual sulfate to the bed at concentrated points. The camber measurements with the rot rotor level was basically we continued that effort um, in the, in the, during the storage phase uh, when the beam was transferred to the field and all the way to completing construction of the bridge and even after casting the deck, we did measure and make sure that, that the, there's a continuous trend that we can pick up from um, some of the girders that were used in, in um, some of the projects here in Iowa. Okay, so I just wanted to, to show you what we learned by doing a uh, measurements more accurately during release of, of the free source force. So here is a beam that cross-section is shown here. Um, the beam was basically had um, strands at the top as well as the bottom. Uh, 
plus we had some hop strands. We let the precasters do what they normally do, but we monitored everything throughout. So you could see the, the top strands were first released, then followed by half strands. Uh, release began, the half strand release completed, so sometimes they start with one strand and go through and finish all of the strands. So you get a number of them, all of them were released within this span of time. Then they started releasing the, the bottom strands. And that's when you start to see the camber growth taking place. So when the bottom strands up until then, you can see there's not much um, gain in camber is seen. When the bottom strands uh, got released, and this is the end of the bottom strand release, the camber grew significantly. So that's what the camber you're looking at. What there are two other interesting phenomena that I want you to observe. One is the bed actually deflected downward, which typically we don't. Uh, account for that. So if there's a bit deflection that's taking place here. And then we also realize that after the beam is released, the beam was sitting on the bed, there was a, a friction between the beam and the bed that was being slowly released, and that means the camber was growing as a function of time, even afterwards. Now, at this point, we lifted the beam and put it back, and at, from that point onwards, the beam uh, camber remained constant. So the, you were able to get rid of the friction by just lifting it and putting it back, and then the, uh, you can see that it remained constant as shown here. So what's interesting here is that if somebody is measuring camber at that point, they would have measured, as soon as they released the bottom strand, they would have measured and gotten a value somewhere here. They would have neglected the bit deflection. They would have neglected potential increase in camber due to uh, friction, or in other words, the friction was actually providing resistance, so the full camber, the instantaneous camber has not been realized. So there are two things that we picked up that have not been considered as issues in the past. One is the bit deflection, the other is the friction. So here's an example of a various bit deflection that we measured. In most cases, the bit deflections are small. Um, the actual magnitude of the bit deflection actually depends on where on the bit the beam is positioned. And obviously, if it's a longer bit, uh, sorry, if it's a longer beam, heavier beam will increase the bit deflection. Uh, that's a typical trend. Uh, what I want you to observe is that the bit deflection in some cases exceeded quarter, quarter of an inch. So when, it, when you get to quarter of an inch and you're talking about measuring uh, camber to the nearest 16, you could see that the quarter inch becomes a significant number. Now here's an example of uh, one beam that you can look at how the numbers add up. So the predicted camber for this beam was about 3.2 inches. That's what the design drawing called for. The plan measured and reported 2.5 inches. We independently measured, and we came up with 2.52 using a tape measure. So what the precast reported is a fair number if, um, you know, we, because we're looking at the same number with the, with the laser level. Now, if we accounted for the bed deflection that we captured in this, as well as the friction, we ended up with 2.88 inches, and the, the string potentiometer actually ended up with close to 3. Now, if you look at that 3 inches of displacement with the 3.19 expected, they are pretty close numbers. But you look at the 3.19 with 2.5 without the friction and the bed deflection, the difference is getting close to 3 quarter of an inch just in the instantaneous value. So that's, that was a concern in terms of, you know, who to blame when you have that much difference in the instantaneous. And it turned out that the beam did have close to three inches. And uh, because the friction and the bit deflection were not accounted for, ends up underestimating the actual camber down to something like two and a half inches. So this is just an example to get a feel for uh, what, what you can um, see in terms of the error that kind of creeps into the, the actual value. Um, what this one shows is the effect of bit friction. So this is showing a number of different beams that we captured. Um, we were measuring the deflection before and after the friction component to show the difference. Um, so after the, the beam release and after you lift up the beam and put it back, so the blue line tells you that each and every time your growth in um, camber because you're lifting and putting it back and that helps you to alleviate the, the friction between the two. We obtain as much as 5 8 inch of displacement, so again a significant number, or in some cases that was equivalent to 25% of the total camber uh, 
that was measured. Uh, so the error that comes from the, the bed friction is also a significant amount that needs to be accounted for. We also uh, observed and identified, observed and, and quantified some of the other variables. So here's an example on the left side. You see uneven surface along the top line. So this is you're looking at the uneven surface across the um, the beam. The um, depending on so there's a gap of about three quarter of an inch. So depending on depending on where you place the level, if you're going to use a rotor level you're going to come up with an, come up with a value that may be off by three quarters of an inch. Sometimes you have this inconsistency uh, in the depth of the, the trowel surface and again depending on where you place on top of an aggregate or uh, some lower spots you could be introducing anywhere from quarter to three quarters of an inch displacement. So what's interesting that at least for our practice here in Iowa is that in the field, the contractor measure camber from the top of the beam. Um, at least two out of the three plants measure the camber to the bottom of the beam. So by not using the same surface in each and every case, we introduce some errors into the into the mix. And this is something we accounted for when we put a, a recommendation together for how the beam should be produced, how it should be measured, the instantaneous camber should be measured and how the contractor should should um, measure the, the actual camber values. And all of that are now being practiced um, in Iowa and, and seems to be working very well. So here's the four different components that I just talked about that seems to affect the instantaneous camber. Now if you take the average over number of beams, for example, the bed deflection comes out to be pretty small. But if you take an individual beam, you see error as much as quarter inch or even more and that becomes an issue. But on the average, this is, doesn't appear to be a bigger problem. Clearly, the friction does contribute more, and then you can see the in inconsistency on the top surface that contribute to uh, the other numbers as well. Um, the new measurement technique that I mentioned has uh, essentially to get rid of most of these problems that we identified in the instantaneous camber measurement. Now, uh, I want you to look at this figure, so this is a variety of beams. These are tape measure reading from the precaster, that's a red line. The camber that accounts for um, the bed deflection, the friction, the inconsistent surfaces. And in some cases, we were able to get the uh, string potentiometer reading. So the black and the green are the, the more accurate value. Um, and we also, um, in some cases, the not all, we didn't capture the data with the string potentiometer. But what I want you to observe is that once you correct the, the, the numbers, you actually end up getting pretty good instantaneous camber value. So if you're doing simulation or if you're doing simplified analysis to calculate the camber, it comes down to what you're going to be comparing that value against. If you have a da data that's not accounting for bit deflection or friction, obviously you're going to have an error that's going to create more challenges and then you don't know whether the actual you know, we typically believe what's measured is going to be correct, then you're going to be looking at your simulation not being right. And uh, so in this case, it turned out that the actual measured value had issues. We also looked at the, the on the design side, what would happen. So the designer tends to predict the design camber. And I think for an example, I did show you that 3.2 inches of displacement. That value can also have some error, and we investigated that. The errors for that calculation can come from the assumed modulus of elasticity, the design versus the actual pre stress forces, the amount of pre stress losses that you accounted for. Uh, in most cases, we don't account for the sacrifice, sacrificial pre stressing strands. And if you don't account for it, that obviously is going to give you a different um, camber value. The transfer length that you assume, as well as when they use section properties or gross section properties, transform section properties or gross section properties um, will dictate. Now, we actually looked at all of these various components and came up with a series of recommendations for the Iowa DOT to uh, use what we think is appropriate. And um, so, for example, we did recommend them to use the uh, ASH to LRFT design uh, equations, LRFT 2010 equations for calculating the modulus elasticity with one change to that, which I will show in the next slide. 
um, we ask them to account for more realistic pre-stress losses and where that number should come from. Um, and then you can see the per transfer length and the second properties we made appropriate recommendations. So here's a, a, another piece of useful information that you may want to pay attention to. If you look at the release strength by the precasters versus the measured, now the, the measured release strength that the precasters check to make sure they achieve the desired number versus the designed release strength that you assume in design, they're not the same, obviously. If you look at, so we looked at for a number of beams, what was the, the specified release strength in the range of 4,500 to 5,500. And in that case, we found that the release strength by the, the precasters tend to be as much as 40% higher than what was anticipated in the design. So the fact that you're going to have a higher concrete or higher strength concrete, increased modulus is going to reduce your camber, and this itself will introduce an error that needs to be accounted for. If you specify in the neighborhood of 6,000 to 85,000 high performance high strength concrete, we found the release strength tend to be about 10 to 12 percent higher than the expected or the specified release strength. So that's a big difference between the expected versus uh, the actual values. Now, on the figure here, I'm showing the percent of design release camber versus the percent increase in a prime C. So if you are off by 40%, you're looking at the, the percent of error that comes into the camber is about 14, 15%. If the error is about 10, 12%, you're looking at 4, 5%. So it does make a difference what you specify for the beam and what the actual strength of the concrete. So one recommendation, you know, one, one, one recommendation that we made to the Iowa DOT is that when they use this particular equation according to ASHTO, which is this expression here on the left, um, you will be using, um, you will be using uh, the measured strength or expected measured release strength rather than the specified strength to get a more realistic number for the uh, actual camber. With this modification, that 3.2 or 3.19 to 3 uh, displacement that I, uh, camber values that I compared, becomes very close to one another, and uh, you, you, you basically able to get what you're looking for here. Okay, with that, let me just move on to the MIDA simulation that we have done. So the MIDA has several features that we were able to use, so that's one of the reasons that we picked MIDAs for this particular study. Um, so I, I talked about the section properties. When you do a simplified view, you, you know, you do cross versus the transform properties. So you can certainly account for the, the transform or equivalent section in the, in the MIDAS analysis. If you have half tendon profiles, sacrificial tendons, we were able to uh, position them uh, as, as we did in the field. Um, the, the transfer of precess was accounted for. This was assumed a transfer is what was used, and we followed the actual recommendation. I have not spent much time in this, but I will be talking about this. There are some cases that support condition changes. So if the if the beam is stored in the in the precast yard, it will have one support condition transferred to the field. will have a different support condition, and you can account for that in the MIDAS analysis uh, fairly easily. Um, the creep and shrinkage effects to bring in a time dependent uh, growth in camber, you can account for this. Um, so in this case. Remember, I mentioned that we developed our own creep and shrinkage equations for this region, and we ended up using um, we ended up using that particular model for this simulation. You can account for stage construction because the boundary condition changes, and therefore I can account for that um, in the analysis. And finally, that if you are concerned about thermal effects, which I will talk about it soon, you can also account for that in the MIDAS simulation. However, on the right side, I'm showing that the, the measurement, uh, you know, there may be uh, issues. Your model results may not reflect the reality. It may be because you have variations in the in the measurement, because you know there are some errors coming to the measurement. We, we talked about that. Uh, the material properties may not be um, uh, reflected accurately, so you may want to pay attention to what would be the more realistic. Um, realistic uh, material uh, 
characteristic that you want to use. And then if you have complex thermal gradients, uh, it will be difficult to model with the current capability. So let me show you what we did. So all of the beams that we analyzed, we did model individually in MIDAS and came up with uh, the actual camber without introducing any assumptions. So in each case, you do the analysis, release the freezers, put in the right properties, I'll give you the instantaneous camber just using MIDAS. And that information was compared to the actually measured value. So if you do that, this figure shows, uh, the next figure shows that the MIDAS instantaneous camber prediction with the actual measure. So the actual measure now I'm reporting is all after we accounted for the bit deflection and the friction and so on and so forth. And you could see that in most cases, the measured and the predicted cameras are pretty close to one another. We did end up getting slightly lower value for predicted camber when the actual measured camber was large. Uh, and then you also see the, the bars indicating the error, of the, the fluctuation for a given type of beam, uh, which is basically indicating that you're going to have some variation because the material behavior, the properties that you're seeing, is going, not going to be perfectly the same. Um, and, and that's kind of reflected. But on, on average, the miners actually capture the instantaneous camber pretty accurately. Even the simplified model with the modification that we made, so any modification that we came up with for Iowa DOT is based on what we learned from miners so that they can um, get a more realistic numbers uh, from their simple calculations. So those are the modifications that we made to the Iowa DOT. Now, I mentioned that we continue to uh, measure the uh, camber, and we did the same thing with the simulation. So the, these MIDAS models, you can continue to um, use a, the MIDAS model to simulate the, the long-term camber. In this case, obviously, you want to be able to use the appropriate support locations, which I will show you. It's not a constant value for any given beam or for any given precaster. Um, Here's the uh, MIDAS accounts for creep and shrinkage. So they have the models. You can use the existing models, or you can uh, specify, which we ended up specifying what model we wanted to use based on our measured uh, behavior. We also accounted for uh, steel and concrete relaxation. Um, we're doing a separate study for Caltrans, which has a, a heavier component for relaxation, as, uh, again, using MIDAS. But in this case, the concrete relaxation is not very significant but it can be accounted for in the, in the analysis. So basically, the MIDAS deploys a time step method. The total strain is calculated assuming um, the co contributions from the, the elastic, the creep strain, the shrinkage strains, as well as thermal strain if you include the thermal effect. And as shown here, it uses a step method and assumes that everything remains constant within that particular um, uh, over a, a small time step and then it accumulates the results uh, to figure out the, the total um, effects on the beam. So that's the typical time step method combined with the minus final element is what we ended up using. So we're shifting gears and looking at long-term camber and what we learned and what we saw in the, in, from the field. Um, so if you go through that process that I just explained and um, simulate, each of these lines, that continuous line shows in this figure is what might have simulated for different types of beams. The, each of the, the dots or the symbols that you see here is what was measured for different types of beams. So you can see the beams anywhere from C10 all the way to BT145, um, giving you different cambers. And clearly it shows we did get good match with the instantaneous camber, now we are not, we don't have any control over the long-term camber. We don't have, we don't see a good trend. There's a sudden drop in the actual camber in the minor simulation, and that comes from change in support location, and that's what's reflected in most cases. Um, so then the question became, where did these two, where did this error come from now in the long-term camber? So we, we investigated into these issues and realize that there are two additional sources that one needs to pay attention to. One, as I said, is the support locations. So here are three different examples shown here, how we found the beams have been supported. 
um, and it comes down to what overhang length that you um, use for the beam. So you may in some precasts use just the uh, overhang length of equal to roughly the depth of the beam. In some cases they have a continuous uh, piece over a you know, four foot segment maybe supporting the, 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 the ends of the beam over anywhere from zero to five feet. Uh, in other cases, we found that the overhang was less than or equal to about 5% of the beam length. So there's no consistency and uh, in some cases we find that in a given plant you may use different uh, ways to support the beam. Now this particular component does add um, confusion or does uh, provide changes to the actual camber. Um, so if you look at the long term camber as, a, as an issue coming from the overhang length, you could see that what we learned is by measuring the overhang length, there's no constant value. The overhang length varied anywhere from uh, 5, 10 inches all the way to 7 feet. Um, so this issue was a concern and what we did was we actually corrected that by running MIDAS analysis uh, with appropriate support location that we found versus assuming zero support location, uh, sorry, zero over, overhang length and that helps us to realize the difference between the two and that's something we accounted for in the analysis. The, the second most uh, important thing that we found for the actual camera during storage is the thermal effect. So it's an interesting figure what you're seeing here. It's uh, uh, the red line is basically uh, showing the temperature variations over a 24-hour period. So this is again measured using sink potentiometer. You have uh, the string potentiometer giving you the changes to the, the camber deflect, the camber values, and we are measuring the, the temperature uh, gradient, basically the temperature difference between top and bottom. And you can see that in the field between morning and or within a 24 hour period, the camber actually grew close to 0.4 inches, came down about 0.2 inches, giving you a total difference of about close to three quarters of an inch. So depending on the time you measure the long term camber, you may be introducing an error here. So typically, the students would go out and do the measurements, you know, late morning, early afternoon, and we would tend to pick a very, you know, higher camber, and that's what you kind of see in most of these uh, plots um, right here. Okay, so let me go back to what we then did. We actually measured this uh, for a, a number of beams. We then measured this thermal issue. And thermal issue also we found that it depends on whether you do the measurement in summer, winter, or fall. It also depends if the beams are stored in a shade or stored in a you know uh, open uh, space where sun can beat on the beam. So we captured different things to figure out how do we quantify these values. So as I said, the the the, the two extreme is that a hot summer day and a and a and a hot day, but it's a, it's a winter. So Basically, there's no uh, the solar radiation is not as active as in the summer cases, which is what causes these problems. So, if you look at some of the the measurements that we picked, anywhere from the top left is the summer, the bottom right is the uh, winter. We'll focus on the the black line. So, the red line uh, difference shows the temperature difference. The black line shows the variation in camber, and you can see that the camber is actually much more significant in the summer. Then for the uh, winter time, winter time the, the growth is pretty much negligible, and um, and therefore we realize that we should account for this in the analysis as well. So this one shows the uh, temperature effects in terms of uh, what you can assume. So depending on a, a temperature gradient that you assume, you can quantify its effects and therefore the associated camber. MIDAS allows you to calculate or account for temp thermal effects using a, a linear temperature gradient. Linear becomes a more severe condition for the actual camber and in, in our studies that's what we ended up doing. We did approximate the camber to be linear but we also looked at the impact of other shapes for the temperature gradient as well. Now if you look at the temperature gradient and try to match the measured versus the design camber, what we found on average was that if you assume a linear camber, linear temperature gradient as you see on the left side, you can see on the right side it shows the actual average camber between the measured versus the, the, the design camber and the different temperature gradient that we assume. So what we found was that 
if you see on average that there is a 15 degree uh, temperature gradient and a linear temperature profile, you can actually get a pretty good um, estimate for the, the expected camber. And that's something that we accounted for in, the, in our final recommendation to Iowa DOT, and that's what's shown in this figure. Here we are showing how the lines would shift, so the, from the blue line to the red line is the shift that you're seeing here. The blue line is basically um, without the temperature effects, the red line is with the temperature effects, and the, the, the data point shows the different data and the scatter that we picture, the capture, and you can see that often we are getting closer or we are shifting towards the actual measured data when we assume that 15% uh, increase. Um, so now we are seeing, I think you're able to see the screen. So um, this one shows a comparison between the the, the, the camera that we measured with the minus simulated value as well as within 30% tolerance. The 30% tolerance is what a DOT typically would allow. So the 30% tolerance is between expected versus the measured values. Um, and um, on the left side, you're seeing how well the So on the left side, you're seeing how well the figures are. I don't think I'm. You're seeing it now, right? Yes. Okay, good. So, so this one shows the comparison between without temperature effects accounted for in the analysis for the width temperature effects accounted for in the analysis. So you could see that we, we were starting with a, an average error of 8.6 percent when you don't account for the temperature. When we assume that 15 degree temperature, it, it, we were able to bring that the, the average data back to the, the 45 degree line so that your average stays the same so that you have this plus minus 30 percent tolerance to account for this 10 percent error. Otherwise, the data gets shifted towards one side and then you lose tolerance because the average is not really matching the 45 degree line. So that's something that we were able to um, do in this case. Okay, so the minus analysis, um, we continued that for the long-term camber as well. And the long-term camber, what happened was that we were able to model we were able to change the boundary condition. So in MIDAS, you can differ, specify different stages and then um, specify the different uh, boundary conditions for each and every stages. And so as the continuity was provided in MIDAS uh, in, in the field, we were able to simulate that in, in, in MIDAS to show that um, we can continue to quantify the actual um, camber of the beams. So this one shows that after the, the deck is placed, we assume a tributary area and all of the, the beams are locked in place at that point after the casting of the deck. And if you look at the response that we picked up from the MIDAS analysis, you see that uh, how the instantaneous camera takes place, and that's a typical example of the, 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 the measured MIDAS, measured value versus the MIDAS response, that your camber grows, your deck gets cast at this point here um, around 140 days, and then, um, the transfer of the cell fate, and then afterwards, the change in camber is pretty much minimal, uh, but there's small growth as a function of time, and this variation is something that we have captured for a number of bridges as part of the particular pr project as well. Now, uh, to, to wrap up the presentation, I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about the, the multipliers that, that we came up with. So the multipliers is something that the DOTs tend to use. They use a multiplier that will be used to multiply the instantaneous camber to come up with what would be the, the appropriate long-term camber. So what we ended up using was that we used series of minor simulations for all of the beams. Then we know that instantaneous camber was accurately captured by MIDAS. We used these results to come up with suitable multipliers for the IODOT to use. The way we came up with this was we looked at the multiplier for different beams 
individually as a beam type. So here, if you look at just the age versus the multiplier, um, this is what we were able to get from the uh, MIDAS analysis. But IODOT was not keen to use different multiplier for different types of beams. And then we came up with an average multiplier. We also looked at the multiplier for different time frames. So if the beam is only 0 to 60 days old, what would be an, uh, an appropriate value? 60 to 180 and over 180. Um, we also, on top of that multiplier, we introduced a, a temp temperature gradient multiplier that's known as the lambda t. And this multiplier was established assuming a linear temperature gradient at 15 degree um, profile or the temperature gradient uh, for that analysis and we came up with the multiplier accordingly. Uh, at the end of the day, we were able to provide two sets of multiplier. One is assuming a zero uh, overhang. In the other case, we recommended that every precaster use overhang distance of L over 30 with L being the, um, the, the actual length of the beam. And with those assumptions, everybody can operate either with the L over 30 or, or support the beam with almost zero overhang. Um, I'll show you the, the how the results came together. The long-term multiplier, so from a research point of view, actually looked at a number of different multipliers. Uh, that's what's shown as M1 through M6, M6 being the, the current IOD DOT practice. The multiplier as a, using used as a function like we have specified, or assume a zero overhang, average overhang, or um, think uh, instead of the set of multiplier, we also gave them just one multiplier with zero and regardless of the beam type and the time because we know the average time that's been used uh, so that that's been used uh, to store the beams in the precast yard so we, we came up with different numbers what you see on the bottom left is the average error that we see for the measured minus the design camber um, so you can see that the average value in the first two three cases we are able to reduce the average value pretty significantly. The second one is what we recommended with the zero overhang brings the average down to about zero. Um, if you look at the percentage of, um, so the, the measured camber minus the design camber uh, as a percentage within plus minus one inches of limits because that's the typical that you don't need to provide any, any additional hoist reinforcement. You could see that on average you should be able to uh, achieve that at 93% of the time if you were to use the adjuster data or with, the, with the overhang or set of multipliers that we recommended with zero overhang. Um, if you choose any other method, obviously that average is going to drop somewhat, uh, but um, it's up to the viewer to decide which number to use uh, for, their, for their studies. So to, to wrap up, uh, let me just summarize some of the key findings. So the camera estimate is significantly affected by basic material properties. That's pretty obvious. The EC is something very important because there's a big difference between what the specific what is specified and what, what's measured in the in the actual precast plant. The instantaneous camera is often inaccurately captured due to the construction practices and the measurement technique used at precast plants. As I said, we do have recommendations that any precaster or any DOT wants to implement. The report provides a fairly straightforward procedure um, and, and all of us all of the plants here are uh, utilizing it. When compared to the accurate instantaneous camber measurements, both simplified method and MIDAS produce good predictions provided that you use realistic modulus values. The long-term camber measurements are significantly affected by two, two variables. One is support location and the other is a solar radiation. Uh, the accuracy of the multiplier is often compromised due to errors in the instantaneous and long-term camber measurements. So, you know, there are multipliers recommended out there for, for use, but when the actual measured values have problem, these multipliers tend, tend to not do a good job. So job to job, you may see significant variations, and it's not clear which one to use. The MIDAS final element models provided insight into the effects of support locations, the solar or thermal effects, and change in support conditions as a function of time, and all of that are used in terms of developing the realistic design multipliers that we, we came up with. Uh, the final slide basically shows a couple of reports that came out of this project. The first one is uh, basically the, our study took going through all of the details. 
The second report is basically the data set of all of the data that we collected. Um, they are available from the project website or the researchgate.net site. Um, you could you could download them. So that's all basically I have. Um, I will. Uh, we have a few more minutes. So I'll just go through and see if I can answer some of the questions that came up here. If that sounds right. Yes. Thank okay. you, Professor Sorry. Uh, in case you didn't know, you can submit your question in the question box. Yes, please have them stated. We already have some questions entered. Um, Dr. Sri, um, please review some questions and cover some um, that you feel very relevant um, to your discussion. Okay, the first question is, is there a general equation having trouble reading the question. Okay, so did the Midas model consider restraint moments? Yes, it did consider them restraint moments. When you introduce the uh, support, the moment will be induced at the support cases, and that's something you can simulate within within Midas. Um, Um, all the slides and the recordings will be available, um, published on our website. Um, a follow-up email will be sent to all the attendees and registrants, so you'll be able to receive those email um, by me. Okay, so somebody asked me to show the website, so I want to just go to the... If you are able to see it, you could say search and find it. I think if you look at Iowa um, Camber project, you should be able to see the site. But it's it's going to be available through the the Midas web page. I'll make sure that Angela has that information. Um, so is there a is there a tolerance specifications on Camber to stop the controversy? Um, so for that question, as I said, the Iowa DOT allows the error of up to plus minus 30 percent. Uh, so the, the issue that we found was that the you know if, if the if you're moving from an average value to plus minus 30 percent, that 30 percent is a pretty generous number. But because the the assumed modulus of elasticity, the way you measure the actual camber, uh, the errors that we discussed, and often that you find that the average error is already shifted to minus. 15%, let's say. So then you don't have that plus minus 30% cushion. And I think what, one of the things that what this study has done is that it brought back the average to 0%. So therefore, you can have that additional plus minus 30% cushion when they do the, the actual practice. Um, OK. Um, due to time being, uh, we want to be um, keeping the time uh, frame that we have. I apologize, but all the questions will be sent to um, Dr. Sri, and uh, we'll provide the answer to all the questions that haven't been answered um, at this point. We'll send it to all the attendees, a summary of the questions and answers, and uh, we'll send it together um, with the recording and the PDF that will be published on our website. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for um, your interest and participating today. Um, have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Suri.